We've just opened the third rotation of the Encounters exhibition and there are two new displays. One of the displays puts into a conversation a painting from 1951 by George Keats with a work that was made 64 years later by contemporary artist Janani Kure. The George Keats painting is titled Candy and Bride and shows a couple with a drummer celebrating a wedding. The bride and groom are depicted in traditional Candian attire, and particularly what's of interest is to look at what the garment that is being worn by the bride, which is most typically known as a Candian sari, a sari that is draped where the frill is showing above the, the hem of the lower part of the sari. And this type of sari has traditionally become associated with not just weddings, but often official events that women attend where they would be almost obligated to wear this outfit. And by default, it has almost become a national costume for women today. And in 1951, when Keat was making this painting, he was obviously thinking about the attire of how then it was used to as a garment that would be worn at a wedding. But today we see it being worn or it being expected to be worn within the government, the civil service, teachers would wear it. And that was where we wanted to think outside of the painting to think about and inform what we would put and put in front of it, which is the work by Janani Kure, which also involves the osseria. The osseria though that Janani has created is not made from the typical fabrics that we would normally associate with it. It's made this time from aluminium and barbed wire. And it is in fact a costume that she wore as part of a performance that she did in 2015. And the performance was really examining a question for her about the restrictive nature of this particular type of sari. A sari that although we know it as the Candian sari, in fact traces its history to not candy, but in fact to South India, where we can trace its history to coming to Sri Lanka during the time of the Nayaka kings, when they took South Indian princesses as their brides. So the costume enters into Sri Lanka that way, is appropriated as a garment of Candian uh, culture, and then slowly is appropriated later on as almost as a default national dress for women. And where Janani comes in with her work, she's almost creating an artwork of protest around how this outfit is today being um, imposed almost as a uniform of national uh, dress to women, for women who go to work in government institutions as teachers um, or civil servants. What Janani is doing is she wears the garment as part of a performance where she walks in the garment, which is made from aluminium and barbed wire, materials that will cause more harm to her if she were to trip or to fall, which is very likely given the constrictive nature of the way that the barbed wire costume is constructed. And this almost kind of proximity to being harmed is her intention because what she is really seeing as an analogy is the way in which the costume or Osiria or the Candian Sari costume is seen as a garment that is inflicting a violence on the choices that women would wish to make on what they choose to wear to work. And that is why she's chosen to create the Osiria out of barbed wire. And why, when we look at her performance, how she is almost endangering herself by wearing it. And what she's trying to call into questions are the, ha the ways in which certain women's outfits are prescribed to them, not out of choice. And why is it that women are being asked to wear certain kinds of garments in a way that isn't um, becoming of perhaps their um, counterparts in, uh, who are male and why therefore we are not given the choice as women to create identities for ourselves as professionals without reliance on costumes that dictate other forms of behaviour that might be seen also as restrictive. The second display, which is part of Rotation 3, includes four artworks. And we begin with an artwork by George Keat as our starting point. And the title of this work is The Offering. And as you can see, it is two people who are engaged in this exchange of a bowl of perhaps 
uh, what we might see as a bowl of rice, could be a bowl of water, but we don't know what actually is being offered between them. We also don't know whether this is a man and a woman or two women. Um, there's an ambiguity um, that we often see in a lot of Keats' work in the way that he describes gender. But if we were to move away from whether they are a man and a woman or two men, um, what we can see is that this is an exchange between two people. And that was our starting point, to think about exchange. Think about what is an offering. We can offer hope, we can offer abstract ideas, we can offer things that are material. But we were thinking in this display to think, what is the most extreme kind of offering? When you look at the Christian theme of the crucifixion, that is where Christ in his crucifixion is offering his own body um, for the salvation of humanity. And we saw that as a fascinating way to think about the ultimate offering. And what we saw too was that there is so much contemporary art which was also drawing off imagery that is based on the subject matter of the crucifixion. Moreover, what we came across in our research was that Keats himself has painted a depiction of the crucifixion. And we commonly know Keats as being someone that references Buddhist and Hindu imagery, but we haven't seen much of his work that references Christian imagery. And he may well have painted other subject matter from other religions, but we've managed to track down two paintings that look at Christian imagery, and they are two crucifixions. And we are showing one of those crucifixions in this new display. And we're showing it in conversation with two other works. One of them is by a contemporary artist called Nelun Harasgama. And Harasgama gives us a very different view of the crucifixion to Keats. And they're shown in a kind of opposition to one another. And Harasgama's work really shows us the crucifix, the actual cross. The body is almost not there, disappeared into the cross itself. But what's interesting in her work is she doesn't call it or title it the crucifixion, she calls it Golgotha. She's referring here to the place in which the crucifixion took place. And Golgotha was the place where Christ is believed to have died. And what she's doing is juxtaposing Christ's suffering with this location. But what Nelun is doing, like many contemporary artists, is not really showing us or telling us about the biblical story. She's only referencing that to talk to us today about our society not of biblical times, but of here and now. And perhaps what by extension we can take from that is she's thinking about suffering in a very specific place. And the suffering she's referring to is the suffering that has happened in this country over the years. And the place, of course, that she's referring to by location is Sri Lanka. The same kind of approach is what we see in the fourth work that is included in this new display, which is by an artist called A. Mark who is a very unknown artist by and large in Sri Lanka. And A. Mark also produces several works that draw off Christian imagery. And we are showing a work depicts the crucifixion. And the crucifixion that we are showing by Mark shows the cross with Christ and two other crosses, which when we look at the story of the crucifixion were the crosses that were used to hang the two thieves that accompanied Christ when he was crucified. But we'll notice when we look at that painting that the, cross, the two crosses do not have the bodies on them. And this is an image by Mark which is showing Christ after he has been crucified. He has died and the two bodies behind him of the thieves have already been removed. And perhaps what Mark is suggesting that we start to think about is the way that we memorialize, the way that we remember those that have died. The two crosses become markers for their absence. And when we think about our cemeteries, those that are Christian, they would mark the absence of that person by a cross form. But the cross also becomes the starting point for thinking about how we memorialize loss, how we mourn those that are no longer with us. And the narrative here takes us perhaps back to where Mark might have been thinking when he made this crucifixion because he was not thinking about the biblical times. He was thinking about here and now, and that for him was that date when he made this work about the crucifixion, which was in 1983. 
Thereafter, it has become a point in which we look back on our history to think about those that lost their lives and how do we memorialise them is perhaps very much at the root of Mark's work.